Good morning. I'm Amory Boulay. Welcome to Wintonberry Sunday Morning Services. We're so glad that you're with us today. Um, we especially want to give a big shout out to all the men and women who are making Sunday morning possible. So we thank God for you. We appreciate you. We wouldn't have Sunday service without you, whether you're at the church live helping us every weekend or those that are helping us virtually. We, we really are thrilled. Uh, that you're you're able to assist in the churches is, is just thriving because of you. So thank you for being part of making church happen every Sunday. 
Um, just a few quick announcements. Uh, first off, if you're joining us online or if you're at the church, you know, welcome again. And know that if you've got a prayer request on your heart, you can either uh, let us know in the church or online virtually uh, by by filling out a prayer tab at the church or clicking the prayer tab at wintermary.org. Let us know what's on your heart so that we can pray for you. You can also give online or give today at the church. Um, we appreciate uh, your tithes and offerings, and we know God is using those in great ways throughout Connecticut. So please uh, give generously. Um, we have a couple of missionary or a missionary and a mission to spotlight in the month of November. The missionary of the month is John and Jenny, and they're in an undisclosed area, but there are plenty of reasons to pray for them. They're dear friends of the church. Uh, their work is great, and we love them very much. Uh, so pray for them, right? Uh, the outreach of the month is Special Touch Ministries. And this ministry seeks to serve people who uh, have a disability, and they do great things. It's a very wonderful uh, outreach that our church does. And so if you'd like to learn more about either the Missionary of the Month or this outreach, please go to wintonberry.org. And if you look under Go, you will see all of the missions that, and missionaries that we have in this church. And we'd love for you to learn more so that you can be praying. Um, just remember, it's Gratitude Month November is, and we have so many reasons to give and to celebrate, and we are giving in three ways this season. Um, so first off, Operation Christmas Child is, is one way to give. Uh, they're taking their donations, which would be a shoe box that you would fill for either a little boy or a little girl. Uh, they take those donations between no now and November 23rd at drop-off centers, which are located online at wintonberry.org. So go to that page and find out where to bring your box this week. And thank you so much for praying over these boxes. And remember, they're getting a Bible uh, message in their spoken language, which is a big deal. And we thank you again for filling those boxes. Many around the world will receive them. Uh, the second way to give is through the Thanksgiving offering. And we're blessing John and Jenny. And we're also blessing the Citadel of Love. Um, please pray about what you want to give. This is always a donation above and beyond what you ordinarily give. And uh, those that receive are, are deeply grateful. So uh, you can give by cutting us a check uh, and uh, dropping it at the back of the church. You want to put in the memo line that this is the Thanksgiving offering. Or if you want to give online, it's a similar process. You just go to the Give tab and, uh, and uh, ask to give in the special offering section. And then the third way that you can give is through the holiday food drive, which I believe ends today. Anything Thanksgiving that you can think of food item wise, please bring in. Uh, that's gonna go to the uh, Bloomfield Food Bank. And we thank you so much for your generosity. Um, we just wanna now shift gears because every year we have this wonderful tradition of celebrating Thanksgiving together on the eve of Thanksgiving. It's gonna be a little different. We're not gonna get together live but we will have a wonderful virtual service on November 25th at seven o'clock. So what we'd like you to do now is look at a video that uh, Faith and Megan prepared earlier this week that just is a simple one that shares about some things that they're grateful for. Here you go. Hi, I'm Faith from the Children's Ministry and this is Megan. Megan. And we just wanted to talk briefly about how we are so blessed with um, some of the ways God has been moving um, this year with children's ministry, even though it's been different. Um, we've been able to find more fun, creative ways to connect with the kids. Um, like Megan did the Zoom session. Yep. Uh, so I thought it was just really cool and I'm thankful that um, I was able to interact more with the kids. and just get to know them on a more like deeper level than what it could typically look like on Sunday. Um, so like there was lots of dance parties, there was lots of fun and laughter. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it was just a ball. Yeah, so we just wanted to wish you a happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Oh, well, thank you, Meg. Thank you so much, uh, Faith. And uh, sorry about the guy who's blowing my leaves. However, I just want you to know, I'm very grateful to God for him, so. <laughs> I think when I do my 30 second clip, I'm gonna include my dear Michael. Anyways, uh, I'm losing my train of thought. Oh, I wanted to say, please send your video in. Uh, 30 seconds to 60 seconds is all we need. 
and uh, we will feature that on November 25th as we celebrate Thanksgiving together virtually at seven o'clock. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we do. We thank you so much for the gift of today and really the gift of this month and having us focus on gratitude and your generosity, Lord. Um, you are such an abundant God and a giving God and a loving God. And so we just want to worship you with a whole heart today, Lord Jesus. And so we pray that you help us to enter in. And Lord, as we bless you with our tithes and offerings this day, we pray, Jesus, you would use that to expand your gospel message here and all around the world. We love you, Lord. We welcome you in this place. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. website we'd really love to have a beautiful compilation video of all the ways that people at Winterbury are thankful this year so it's not going to take you long just just a few minutes I encourage you to do that this week um, this year today is our annual day of prayer for the persecuted church we do this once a year I think this is our 13th year now doing this um, you know we lately with the race conversation we've been talking about this word privilege well if you want to understand the concept of privilege, just think about being American Christians. Because here in America, if we want to avoid thinking and about persecution, we can do that. We really can. But when there are some nations around the world, one out of eight Christians, one out of eight Christians in this world are being actively persecuted. None of us are experiencing anything that would register on the persecution reg uh, uh, meter. And so we have the privilege in America of not thinking about persecution, just kind of forgetting about it and, and moving on with our lives. But we're going to use that today to remember the persecuted. We're going to use that freedom that we have to pray for the persecuted church. So to start off this morning, what I want to do is just have you watch this short two-minute video. It's a, uh, a sister in North Africa. And what's interesting about this video is she's going to tell you about how God used technology to help her in her loneliness as a persecuted believer in North Africa. So watch this video, and then I'll tell you a little more about what's happening worldwide in terms of the persecution of Christ Church. Watch the video. À ce moment, là, j'ai pensé que il y a aucun chrétien ou chrétienne du, du l'Afrique du Nord. J'ai pensé que c'est moi la première, la première personne qui pense de devenir chrétienne en Afrique du Nord. J'ai commencé les recherches sur YouTube. J'ai essayé de voir, de connaître c'est qui Jésus et sur Facebook aussi. J'ai essayé de trouver quelque chose. Il y avait une fille qui est venue pour me donner la Bible et ils ont dit qu'on ira à l'église. J'ai posé la question, est-ce que je peux venir avec vous Elle a dit oui. J'ai essayé deux fois de parler, d'ouvrir un, une discussion avec mon père. J'ai dit, bon, si j'ajoute une autre mot, ça y est, il va me tuer. Maintenant, mon entourage, il n'y a aucune, aucun chrétien. Mais dans la Bible aussi, ils nous disent qu'on doit être une communauté, l'unité. On doit être dans le même corps, tous les chrétiens.
how she said we're one body in Christ, right? The theme for this year's day of prayer is Romans 12. Mourn with those who mourn. Rejoice with those who rejoice because we are one body. And so that's what we're doing here this morning. So let me just share a few statistics about what's going on worldwide. And then we're going to get a little more specific later on. There should be a slide there. Um, thank you. I know you can't read these. Let me read them to you. Just And it, it's a little overwhelming. Numbers sometimes are hard to put your hand around. But in the last 12 months, there have been 9,488 churches or Christian buildings that were attacked, burned, destroyed. Almost 9,500. 3,711 Christians were detained without trial, arrested, sentenced, and imprisoned. 3,700 around the world thrown in prison because they believe in Jesus. 2,983 Christians this year were killed for faith-related reasons. On average, that means there are eight Christians killed per day because they believe in Jesus Christ. And then here, 260 million Christians are experiencing high levels, high levels, this isn't minor levels, high levels of persecution just within the top 50 countries on the world watch list. 250 million, that's one out of every eight Christian in the world is suffering severe persecution. Let me show you what it looks like on the map. This is the Open Doors World Watch List. Anywhere you see color is where there is some form of high persecution. The yellow is high, the orange is very high, and then the red is extreme persecution where horrendous things are going on now. I know we have a mixed audience, so I'm not going into any of those details. If you go to Voice of the Martyrs, uh, Open Doors USA, any of those websites, you can get all the details. The, the countries in red is where the most persecution is happening. And I've listed them. There's 11 countries that make up those extreme persecution. Um, what I'd like to do right now as prayer is I'd like you all, between people online and people here who are present physically, I'd like you all to choose, pick one of those countries. Uh, my favorite number is 11, so I'm going with Syria. All right, but you pick a country, and I'm assuming between all of us, all 11 countries will get covered. But I'd like us to pray for the next few minutes. Here are some things that you can pray, just some ideas. Courage to stand for Christ and to share Christ. Secondly, strength to stand firm in spite of family uh, disowning and things along those lines. Release from prison for those who've been put in prison. Most of them have been put in on, on just very flimsy charges. Basic provisions, many persecuted Christians around the world lo are, lose their jobs, are thrown out of their villages, and they don't even have a place to live, let alone eat. And then Bibles and community, like you heard with Islam, where Islam has no community whatsoever until she found that one church. And even there, she's got to be careful. So these are just a few things you can pray. So let's just take a few moments now. You can pray quietly in your heart. Um, if you're at home, feel free to pray out loud. But let's go ahead and, and take a few moments and, and come to the Lord. So Father, as we choose a nation and lift that nation up to you, I pray that you would work in each one of our hearts, that we would enter in to the suffering of our brothers and sisters, Lord. It's not an option. It really isn't in the body of Christ. We, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. And so Father, help us to enter in now, I pray. Go ahead and pray to the Lord, each one of you individually, about one of these countries.
Father, we lift up to you our brothers and sisters in all 11 of these countries in particular. And we pray that you would meet them right where they are right now. Lord, as I was praying, I had just this overwhelming sense of someone in Syria who feels like no one knows who they are. No one knows they're suffering and they're feeling hopeless. Father, would you meet every brother and sister of ours who feels alone and hopeless right now. Meet them right where they are by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we are, may they sense our prayers for them and know that they're not alone. And we pray, Father, that you would enable them to experience your peace, your shalom. It's like a river in their souls and their spirit. Lord, strengthen them, we pray. And we sing this song on their behalf, Lord. Let's stand.
thank you so much that it is well with our soul, even in the midst of chaos and trouble and difficulty. Thank you, Lord, that you are with our brothers and sisters as they struggle even right now. May they know in their soul, it is well, it is well, it is well. You are in control. Help them, Lord, to not lose their faith. Encourage our brothers and sisters around the world, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated again. Becca, you have, um, for those who don't know, Becca has served as a missionary in lands of persecution. And um, she has friends who are still there now, and she called so that we could, we prayed generally before, but let's hear some specific prayers and situations. So can you share some of your conversations? And you also had a photo for us, I believe. I just wanted to share a little bit about um, the region near uh, my parents, actually, John and Jenny Berger, in, um, in the kind of the Middle East region. Um, but specifically, I wanted to share about Iraq, um, the northern region of Iraq. So um, there's a picture that is coming, but, um, and it, it's just, I'll just explain it now, but it's a picture of um, believers worshiping um, in an underground uh, area of Iraq. And... Um, Iraq is a, it's a Muslim nation, and um, the persecution there is, is pretty severe. Um, uh, and specifically, um, a few years ago, we might all remember, um, uh, the, the militant group ISIS uh, swept through the, really that region of the Middle East, but um, attacked much of the world. And because of that, many of the, the remnant of Christians that already were in Iraq fled, and so there was a massive, uh, mass exodus um, during that time. And so what's been amazing is that since that time, in the last five years, um, many people have been fleeing to Iraq for, for safety. Oh, there we go. Um, yeah, so this is just a picture from when I was living there. Um, and, um, and so... Many, uh, since in the last five years, um, specifically, a lot of Syrians have actually been fleeing into Iraq, um, Sy and Syria was one of those uh, nations, and so yep. um, there, as many Syrians and other um, unreached peoples have been moving to Iraq for safety, um, the church is growing and becoming... Um, is, is it's starting to fill as they receive the gospel, um, but with that, the, um, the suffering is pretty pretty severe. Um, so I just wanted to share, I, I actually just chatted with a, um, a few of my friends that are still serving there, and um, there's one family actually um, I'd love to just pray for us to pray for now. They're a Syrian family who uh, received Jesus this year, and uh, they um, have been baptized, and they are uh, being discipled, um, but they just, I think in the last couple of weeks, have been starting to receive death threats. Um, from their communities and I believe their family. Um, it's a married couple with four children. So I thought we could just pray yeah. for them specifically. Um, I won't mention their names, uh, but just to just to cover this family um, as you know, representing one of so many that are yes. um, facing a similar kind of persecution where they have to be living in secret um, to. Uh, for now, to, uh, un unless as they um, receive courage to, to share um, as the Lord leads them. So, yeah. so I'll just pray for, for this family, this Syrian family, and um, just invite you to join me. God, I just want to lift up um, this family to you right now, this, um, this married couple and their, their four children. Um, Jesus, I thank you for for encountering them this year, God, and I thank you for those who, other local believers and, and those who have been surrounding them with your love and uh, discipling them, Jesus. And God, I just pray today that they would um, just receive peace in their hearts um, to, to know that you sit on the throne, God, that you reign. And um, I thank you, God, that, that you... Um, reign over their lives, and so I just pray for, I pray for a, um, a courage and a boldness, Lord, to rise in them, to to trust you, and to just um, 
to, try, to, to just place their lives in your hands, God. I thank you, Jesus, that you, um, your burden is light. And so I, I pray that you would just lift this specific family's, um, the burdens of them off today, God, that they would rest in your peace, that they would trust you. And um, Jesus, I pray for this entire region, God. They represent one of, of so many um, uh, Syrians and, and those just within this entire region of, uh, of the world, God, that are um, daily just, uh, just having to choose boldness every day um, when they step out the door and choose courage, God. So we just um, stand with our brothers and sisters today, Jesus, and we, we, we pray that, God, that you would, um, that you would uh, continue to just pour your spirit out in this land and in this, um, in this region of the world, God, and that you would, um, that you would just use, um, use them mightily, God, for your kingdom. So we just, we thank you for this family, and God, I just pray that, um, that you would protect them, Lord, that you would um, just uh, continually, that your spirit would be um, just speaking to them and directing them, God, that they would grow, that this would be, um, this moment, God, would just be a moment where they can lean into you and trust you, and that you would um, just grow their faith together, Jesus. So we just bless this family, God. We bless Iraq, and, and we, we bless um, Syria as well, Jesus. We just uh, thank you for what you're doing in this in this region, God. And so, um, yeah, amen. Amen. It's amazing how God is able to bring beauty out of ashes. Probably in your own life you've experienced that. <clears throat> but this has been true for the people of God both now throughout the centuries. In the Deep South during American slavery, over 6,000 African-American spirituals were orally passed down, and many of those survive to this day. And they speak of hope in the midst of suffering. All of these songs were birthed out of tremendous suffering. And so let's join into that as we sing this familiar African-American spiritual. Let's stand. Ah uh -huh. 
Father, again, strengthen our brothers and sisters who are feeling alone, who are feeling, Lord, that you're not even with them. Lord, maybe they're beginning to lose their faith. Would you strengthen them even in this moment if they're laying in a cold prison in Afghanistan or Pakistan? Lord, if they're being thrown out of their homes in Laos or Algeria, Whatever they're suffering, Lord, would you help them to know Jesus is enough. You are enough, Lord. Give me Jesus. Help them to know that you love them and you're with them. Father, please, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. One more video for you to watch this morning. It's a man named Rajesh who is actually someone who's helping persecuted Christians in the nation of India. It's about a five-minute video. Watch this, and then we'll get into the scripture for this morning. I would not say that I chose God, or I decided to follow God, but I would rather say God chose me and made me follow him. In, In the year when I was 16 year old, I happened to attend a youth conference. And I I just went to attend the youth conference, you know, to have fun. I was standing at the back and the preacher tells my name from the podium. Rajesh, the Lord is calling you. You are wearing red shirt. You are here in this campus, come front. But I was so scared because I hadn't had any experience before like that. I used to go in church, but if you asked me to stand in, I would never go front. And he called me by name. He prayed for me. I felt the very presence of Holy Spirit in my life. I was shaken within. I can't express, explain that experience that I went through experience of the Holy Spirit, you know, it's so powerful. I was born into a Christian family, but had no experience of persecution myself. The kind of persecution that Christians face in India is first, as the physical assault. They are mostly beaten, mall handled, and uh, physically they are being tortured. The very first incident that I went to visit, I went to visit the pastor. He was badly beaten by the uh, goons and the fanatics. But he was not, he was not in pain or he was not sad. You could, you could see a happiness on his face. I mean, that was something very amazing for me. That was my first encounter to somebody who was directly persecuted and I was going to meet somebody as, 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 a, as a partner to pray, to encourage. I, I was going to encourage him. And when I saw his face, I myself was encouraged. What a man he is. He is beaten badly, but he is smiling. When we came out of the house, we saw that people were staring at us. All the eyes around those place, those colony, They were looking at us as if we have done something very big mistake. We started 
walking fast came to the car we saw the car it was completely you know colored with the spit that people in india eat pan so they spit over our car they made it as dirty as they could we could immediately understand that situation is it could become worse here I was I was scared and my heart started throbbing pumping and I was I was scared I I don't know what to do as we crossed the gully we saw that around 15 20 boys who were standing in their bikes and they were looking to us and they were not giving us way out people started chasing us all the young boys they wanted to stop us and beat us and they they chased that around 10 kilometers and all these 10 kilometers our prayer was lord please be with us yes christian life is a life of risk you know even if you don't live in a country with fanatics but if you live with christ your christianity can put you through the most suffering church in india is house church because they are the they are isolated they can be easily targeted they are not united they are scattered here and there so if you want to pray for india pray for this house church movement because they are the easiest victims of persecution the prayer is the core it is it, it's the center epic you know when you don't know anything just pray when you don't understand anything pray you will understand when you don't know pray in midst of persecution churches are growing more and so i would say yes uh, through the persecution god is uh, god is making the church grow and it is joy to serve the persecuted church because when you serve the persecuted church you actually serve the lord father we lift up to you the persecuted church in india We pray Lord for the house church movement in particular which is multiplying disciples at a record rate. Lord, there has never been a movement of the gospel since the first century like what's happening around the world right now. We we're not seeing it in America, Lord. We're half asleep over here. But in these persecuted countries, Lord, where you're either a believer or you're not, the disciples are multiplying like crazy. And we thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, the paradox and the perplexity of the gospel lord that on the one hand there's so much pain and suffering and yet on the other so much joy and growth and so we take solace in that but be with our brothers and sisters in india lord who are suffering persecution especially in the last 5 10 years as radical uh, hinduism has risen up replicating radical islam We don't hear about radical Hinduism a lot, but it's rampant in India right now. And so we pray that you would strengthen those who are suffering for your name in the country of India. Be with them, encourage them, strengthen them. And Lord, we pray for them as well as all other brothers and sisters around the world. And Lord, as we have the pleasure now of turning and opening up a Bible freely talking about it without fear of being imprisoned. Lord, help us to take this privilege we have of freedom and use it well speak to us now as we look at your word we pray this in Jesus name amen so one final word on persecuted christians there's um voice of the martyrs give out this monthly magazine again if you just go to their website voiceofthemartyrs.com you can sign up for these magazines and other resources that will help you to keep praying for the persecuted church but this morning uh i want us to keep thinking about persecution but through the scripture in the last video we just watched <clears throat> rajesh from india said that the christian life he said is a life of risk 
But he also said that there's joy in the midst of the persecution. Someone who could agree with him was Stephen. You all remember Stephen from Acts chapter 7? He was the very first person in history who was stoned for believing in Jesus Christ. This is a rendering of it. First person put to death for Jesus. Just as he was about to be stoned, you might recall, he looked up and, and he saw something. And here's what he said. He said, look, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. What a moment. I just can't even imagine what that moment must have been like. It's unspeakable horror mixed with transcendent joy. Terrible and yet powerful. But not quite powerful enough to impact this guy on the right. Because that's a young man. And all the witnesses laid their cloaks and coats at his feet. His name was Saul. And he was completely unmoved. Both at the pity of what was going on or the awe of, of how Stephen was going through it. Instead, with his blood and zeal pumping through his veins, he immediately took off to eliminate the Jesus sect. Last week, we began our series on the gospel uh, as found in the book of Galatians, entitled, No Other Gospel. There is no other gospel. We learned that Galatians have a bad case of buyer's remorse. Remember, we talked about that last week. They're wondering, you know, should, should we hold on to this gospel of grace or go back to a rules-based gospel? Alarm, the apostle Paul wrote them a letter to to. to to warn them back and persuade them back to grace. It was appropriate for him to be the one to write this letter because he himself had experienced God's amazing grace. As we'll see this morning, it had changed him from chief persecutor to chief preacher. Let's think about the power of the word of God this morning. You can go ahead and open up to Galatians chapter one. Now we left off last week at verse 10. And it says that Paul says, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Am I trying to please people? If I was still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. There's a group of people called the Judaizers. We talked about them last, last week. They think you have to keep to the Jewish law. You have to convert to Judaism if you're going to follow Jesus Christ. He's a Jewish rabbi. And they say that Paul is not preaching the right gospel and he defends, he's, and they say he's a people pleaser because he's trying to water down the message and say, you don't have to keep the law. No, 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 you can just through grace be saved and you're fine. And they're saying, see, he's simplifying, he's a people pleaser, he's trying to make the gospel message palpable. And Paul says in verse 10, if I were trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. He's saying that people pleasing and serving Christ don't go together. They just don't go together. Now, how does Paul know that? One word, persecution. Although unmoved at Stephen's unjust stoning, later on, as we'll see later this morning, Paul came to faith of Christ, and when he did, I'm sure, I got to imagine, there were nights when he would remember that scene when his now brother Stephen, and he stood there and let that happen. Vivid memories of remembering how Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, drives so bravely. See, people pleasing and serving Christ don't go together. So he's saying, if I'm a people pleaser, I would not be serving Christ because it leads to persecution. And he makes that clear by sharing his story, starting in verse 11. So I want you to know, brothers, I'm no people pleaser. The gospel I preach is not of human origin. I didn't receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it from revelation from Jesus Christ. So the first point Peter, Paul makes this morning is this, the purity of the gospel. The gospel comes from God. Because how could someone like Paul, so cold-hearted, so zealous for destroying the church, come to faith in Christ? How does that happen? It can't happen just through studying. It happened, he said, because he met God himself directly through Christ. And because it came that way, it's a pure gospel that he's bringing, a pure gospel. It's pure, 100% God. Now, the Judaizers had three attacks against Paul. There were three things they accused him of. The first thing, oh, Paul, you made it up. Your message was just him on his own thinking it up. It's the second thing, he's a second-class apostle. 
I mean, he just got it from the apostles in Jerusalem. And not only that, number three, he got it wrong. It's a distortion of what he was taught. See, so, so he didn't learn correctly or he came up with it. And Paul says, no, 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 no. He says in verse 12, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. It's so important. One commentator worded it this way. He said, revelation was not the gift of a body of information or a systematic knowledge about God. He didn't study it. He didn't have it passed down. No, no, no. It was an act of self-revealing. God came to Paul in the person of Jesus Christ. He entered Paul's life and took command. Paul is saying the gospel, is, the gospel I'm bringing you is believable because it came directly, re revelation from God. It's 100% pure. And you know that's true because what else can explain me choosing this path in light of who I was? And then he starts to explain who he was. Verse 13. You've heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and I tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my own people and I was extremely zealous for the traditions of my father. Paul grew up in Judaism, both in the teaching of Judaism and in the culture. And both of those were sacred in his mind. He's saying that no one knew, loved, or lived Judaism more powerfully than he did, more true than he did. And in the book of Acts, we read that. We read that he was taught by the greatest rabbi of his day, Gamaliel. In other words, he says, I have the Jewish equivalent of an Ivy League education, and not only that, I'm the valedictorian by a mile. So out of this deep loyalty and love for all things Jewish led Paul to hate anything that would dare come against Judaism. He hated Gentiles, he hated Christians. And he persecuted it, it said, to the, um, to the verge of destroying it. The word destroy is such a strong word in the Greek. It's a word that was used of soldiers ravaging cities and completely pillaging and destroying them. Listen to Paul as he describes what he was like at, at this stage in his life. He said this in Acts 26. I too was convinced I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus in Nazareth. And that's just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time, he said, I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished. And I tried to force them to blaspheme. That means he was probably torturing them. I was so obsessed with persecuting them, he says, I even hunted them down in foreign cities like animals. If Paul lived today, this morning in our time of prayer, we would have been praying for a guy like him. God, somehow stop this man. Like Boko Haram in Nigeria or ISIS in the Middle East. Stop them. We, they're, they're, we imagine them as these horrendous people. Paul would be among their number. And we pray, Lord, change Boko Haram, change ISIS, change these, these radical Hindus and Islams who are hurting your people. That's, we can't even imagine God doing it. How in the world can a guy like Paul turn to Christ? Verse 15. But when God, don't go any further. But when God, as <laughs> soon as God is thrown into the equation, whew, everything changes. The one force in the universe that can explain this kind of a turnaround is not other than God himself. And look how he describes it. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me. Stop there again. Just soak that in. What a beautiful description of the power of the gospel. Look at it again. Look at, look at this. I'm going to lay it out for you. Look it up here. But when God, three things he does. He set me apart from my mother's womb. 
He had a plan from the beginning. And then God called me by his grace. Didn't deserve it. And then God was pleased to reveal his son to me. The word for pleased there is the same one used when the father says of Jesus, this is the one I am pleased with. God was pleased to reveal Christ in and through the apostle Paul. All that is God. Salvation is all of God. Guys, this is the point of the book. Salvation has nothing to do with you and me. We have no part in our salvation. It is all God, beginning to end. Beginning to end. All we do is respond to the call. I love how the theologian Karl Barth used to speak of this reality. He said this, true Christians are the victims of a successful surprise attack by God. I love that. I think that's a beautiful way to put it. And that's our second point this morning, the power of the gospel. Not only is the gospel pure because it came directly from God, how else to explain this persecutor becoming a preacher? Not only that, but it's power. It can redeem even someone like Paul. And God's been doing it for a long time. Back in 1982, I've shared this before, I was a mess. I had tried to take my life earlier in the year, and I was just engrossed in sinful, awful behavior with a massive guilt conscience. I was so afraid of my eternal destination. But when God, but when God intervened, 38 years ago this past Wednesday, November 11th, 1982. But when God happened to me. But God changes everything. He called me by name, just like he called Paul by name, just like he called Rajesh by name. It changed Rajesh, it changed me, and it changed Paul. Has it changed you? Have you encountered the living Christ? There's no one like him. No one like him. All grace, arms open. Oh, how he wants you to go running into his arms. Paul responded, and it changed his life on a dime. Let, let's, let's read on. Let's pick back up verse 15. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being, I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia. And later, I returned to Damascus. Paul says he was saved by God so he might preach him among the Gentiles, the ones he previously hated. He's saved to serve his kingdom calling and purpose. We all have a kingdom and calling and purpose, and it's crucial we understand what that is, and then we follow it. God, Paul got on it right away. And notice his immediate response. It wasn't to go up to Jerusalem Seminary. It wasn't to go learn or get some validation that his gospel is the right gospel, that he really had met Christ. He didn't need that validation. Why? Because it had actually happened. He met Jesus. Instead, what does he do? He goes into Arabia, it says. Verse 18 is going to tell us he went for three years. What did he do there? We have no idea. There's no recording of what he did for three years. You can see here, here's Jerusalem. And he went up to Damascus because he wanted to persecute the Christians. And then when he got there, he ended up meeting Christ. He goes out into Arabia. That's a desert. Some think he went and preached. Others think he went and he was just taught by the Lord through the Spirit for three years. We don't know. I do think it's interesting. A couple commentators pointed out. Isn't it interesting that, that the disciples spent three years being trained by Jesus and maybe Paul spent three years being trained by Jesus as well in the Arabian desert? Interesting. Either way, he eventually made his way to Jerusalem, verse 18. He says, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. He wasn't there long. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I'm writing to you is no lie. Paul takes a sacred oath, just like we would in court. I swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God. It's basically what verse 20 is, is doing there. He says, listen, I, what I'm saying here is the truth, and I did, I was only 15 days with Peter. It's not like I got all this information from him. No, I already had it, and they accepted me. Peter and James, the two key leaders, they accepted me as an apostle. 
winter is an equal. Now, one other thing I want you to notice here, I think it's interesting to note that Paul went back to a place that would be very dangerous for him. Jerusalem would be dangerous for two reasons. Number one, we also read in Acts, I don't have time to share it with you, but in Acts we read that the Christians weren't convinced he really had turned. This is the guy who would probably put my brother, my sister, my mother, my, my, you know, my, my father to death. So is he really? So he's going back to Jerusalem with a lot of people angry at him. And the Jews are angry at him. But he goes there anyways. He realized that persecution is part of the deal of being a true Christian a servant of Christ. Here's what he said to his protege, Timothy, at the end of his life. He said, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Let me ask each of us, when's the last time you were persecuted? I need to ask me, when have I been persecuted for my faith? Because according to this, it's not optional. If we aren't being persecuted, why not? I'm pretty sure we're not living in a Christian nation. It's part of the call. And it's been that way from the beginning. Take a look at this uh, picture of all the apostles. And I know you can't read it. Let me read it to you. James the Greater, stabbed with a sword. James the Lesser, stoned to death. Jude, filled with arrows. Philip, crucified. Thomas, thrust with a spear. Paul, beheaded. Peter, crucified upside down. Matthew, stabbed with a sword. Judas, suicide. Simon, crucified. Bartholomew, flayed and beheaded. Andrew, crucified on an X-shaped cross. Matthias, crucified. The only one who was, didn't suffer a violent death was John. Died a natural death, but after a lengthy exile. Persecution is part of following Jesus. And all of those men were honored to suffer for Jesus. Just as we saw this morning when Rajesh talked about the pastor that he had met. Now Paul continues his story, knowing that persecution is part of the deal. He says in verse 21, Then I went to Syria and Cilicia. I was personally unknown in the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report, Hey, the man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praise God because of me. So back to, uh, to our map here. First he went to Caesarea. There were, when he went up to Jerusalem for those 15 days, according to Acts 9, at the end of that there was a plot to kill him. So the, the disciples got him out of Jerusalem. They brought him to the shore at Caesarea. And he got on a ship. And he went back to his hometown in Tarsus, which is up in the region of Cilicia. And then for the next 11 years, between Cilicia up north and Syria over here, we just prayed for Syria this morning, he went back and forth between those regions fairly anonymously for 11 years, preaching the gospel. And the, why is he telling us this? Because he's making the point. I was very far away. There was no internet in these days. There's no television. I was very far away from the brothers down in Jerusalem. I wasn't being managed by them. I wasn't being taught by them. Everything I'm bringing you, I'm bringing you because it was revealed directly to me. It wasn't some abridged version like the Judaizers are saying. What I'm proclaiming came directly from God. If it came directly from God, it should be received as being from God. And a matter of fact, he closes it up by saying, and all the believers, when they heard it in the churches in Judea, when they heard about him, they didn't see him, but they heard about him. They praised God because of me. They're praising God that God has taken this persecutor and turned him into a preacher. And that brings me to my final point this morning. The perplexity of the gospel. On the one hand, it is terrible the kind of suffering that believers have to go through for Christ, including Paul. But on the other hand, there is so much joy. So much joy. As Rajesh said, the Christian life is a life of risk, but there's joy in the midst of it. Paul experienced that too. In 2 Corinthians, here's how he worded his own experience. He said, we're hard pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not in despair. We're persecuted, but we're not abandoned. We're struck down, but we're not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that 
the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. Believers down through the ages have shared that testimony. One of those was John Newton, who wrote the hymn Amazing Grace, which you all know. I don't have time this morning to tell his whole story, but it's, his story is very well summarized on his tombstone. Take a look at his tombstone. I'll read it to you. Newton's tombstone says, John Newton, clerk, once an infidel and libertine, a servant of slaves in Africa was by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ preserved, restored, pardoned, and appointed to preach the faith he had long labored to destroy. God has been redeeming Paul's for centuries, and he's still doing it even now as we speak. Thank you, Lord. Let's close by coming before the Lord and singing the song that God put on Newton's heart that's touched so many lives over the years. Amazing grace, let's stand.
thank you for your amazing grace. Lord, how else to explain turning Paul from persecutor to preacher? How else to explain any of us knowing you personally? How else to explain what you're doing in the midst of the pain of the suffering around the world, persecuted Christians who are experiencing joy in the midst of it? How else to explain but the reality of the living Christ. Lord, may we walk with you and may all of our brothers who are suffering walk with you and know just as you promised and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Thank you, Lord, for your amazing grace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again for praying. Please continue to pray for the persecuted church. If you'd like prayer, Steve Eggie would love to pray for you up here. Go and be well. Continue to remember persecuted brothers and sisters. <laughs> oh, weird. All of a sudden, I have a brain. Yes. <laughs>